Lisa, thank you so much for making the time and stopping by. Oh my God. Thanks so much for having me, homie. Happy to be here. You're so cute. You really are. You're like epic, fierce, but adorable <laughs> at the same time. Um, thank so you. <laughs> you just wrote this book, which really chronicles the yummy wisdom that you sort of took away from this whole journey that you've been on, which is so incredibly awe-inspiring. It's hard to even wrap my head around what you've done. It's just like literally jaw-dropping. Um, so I want to get into this book. I, I, I love the title, Radical Confidence. I feel like the number one pandemic is not COVID. It's this I'm not enough. I'm unworthy. I mean, it's just rampant. So I love that you wrote this book. So Thank you. Um, I feel like I want to dive into the book and then we'll backtrack, you know, we'll backtrack and we'll talk a little bit about your journey, but let's start where we are here today. Why did you feel so compelled to write a book that really has to do with radical confidence? Yeah. So the thing was just to give some context. So I was a stay at home wife for eight years. I was supporting my husband. I was brought up Greek Orthodox. So I was, had the belief that I would be a stay at home wife. I was putting clothes out for him, cooking for him every day. And that was my role. And cut to now where you see me, I've built, um, co-founded a billion dollar company. Now impact theory, we have over 500 million views on our content. Um, and I've written a book. And so many people keep asking me, Lisa, where do you get your confidence from? How did you go from being stuck and paralyzed, not believing in yourself to accomplishing all these amazing things? Like, I want your confidence. And girl, when I say I was looking around and I'm like, who are they talking to? <laughs> because they're, they're surely not asking me about confidence. Because if you heard the words that were in my head, every single step of the way, I had doubts, I had insecurities, even in writing the book. After all those accomplishments, the very first words out of my mouth when a literary agent approached me about writing a book, the very first words were, who would buy a book from me? Now, that is what I realized, that people think that it's confidence, but what they see is someone that just keeps moving forward. And so for me, I was like, I have to write, that is what I need to write about because it is a false promise if you think that you need confidence in order to get started. And so how do I explain that you have to just get started? But now look, saying that to someone, that maybe has anxiety, um, has overwhelm. It's not easy to just say, oh, just face the fear and do it anyway. That won't help. And I had the crippling anxiety that for eight years, while I was a stay-at-home wife, I honestly thought the only way I could speak up and say that I was unhappy is if I had the confidence, which is how I ended up staying there for eight years. And what I realized was I didn't need the confidence. Confidence is the byproduct of taking action. And so what I need to do is come up with a game plan to get out of my own way so that every single day I can ignore all the negative thoughts in my head telling me that I'm not good enough and I can keep moving forward. And over time, with those actions, you create um, competence. And then with competence, the confidence comes. But the confidence is the byproduct, but it's the thing that we all want in order to get started. So I'm like, guys, we don't have to. Here's a blueprint. Here's 10 lessons that I've literally had to do and learn every step of the way that took me from being utterly stuck, not having the confidence to being the person you see today. Wow. That's so amazing. I never would have thought, and I, I know a little bit about you, but I really didn't know that part about you being a stay-at-home wife and taking out somebody's clothes every day. I mean, it's just so not in even the lexicon of what anyone mm -hmm. thinks when they're around you. And for you to be able to move from there to where you are now, how did you do that? Like, how did you even recognize, wait, this has to stop if I'm not happy. And by the way, there's probably a lot of people who are truly fulfilled and happy doing that. And I don't want to put it down, but right. for you, it wasn't aligned and it wasn't a fit. So if that was the case for you, how did you A, get really clear and then extricate yourself from that dynamic? Yeah, thank you for saying that because to me, I don't honestly care what anyone wants. Like, if your goal is to 
sit on the couch and watch reruns of Sex in the City because that fills your heart up so much. And so what you want is maybe a nine to five or you want a job that is part time and you'd rather live in a tiny apartment and just watch Sex in the City on rerun. Freaking respect. Like I'm not here, you know, the, the language almost has changed where people just like, you know, create impact. It's like, no, not everyone wants to create impact. Right. Like why, why are we even putting that freaking pressure on anyone? Like, uh, so my whole book and my whole message is what life do you want and are you living it if the answer is now no how the hell do you get there so that means making all kinds of changes you may be the person that is listening that has spent the last 20 years building up their professional career right you've said from day one I want to be a businesswoman I want to work up the way up the ladder maybe you want to start your own company and you've been going hard and you're in your college there and you've been telling everyone and 20 years down the line let's say now you're VP of the company or you're president of the company and you realize oh my god this is no longer for me and you know what actually will fill my heart right now is being a stay-at-home mother. Amazing. Why aren't you doing it? That's my point. How do we help each other get to the goal and stop the judgment of how um, we perceive people thinking that we should live our lives? So that's really where I start from. I love that. Is when you, how many times were you asked as a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? All the time, right? Did anyone ever, has any kid's answer ever been, I want to be fine? Like, I want to be okay. Never. Never. But yet, I lived eight years of where people were asking me, how are you doing, Lisa? Fine. How are you? Okay. How's life? It's all right. Like, why do we've settled with that as an answer? And that's what the book is about, is um, identifying, hey, you may not realize that you're not living the life you want. So how... How do we acknowledge it? It all starts with the acknowledgement of it and then assessing what is that goal? What is that life that you actually want? And some people don't know. So the way that I try to phrase it for people is right now, maybe I call it purgatory of the mundane. Your life is just mundane enough that you're just in purgatory. You haven't hit rock bottom because let's face it, a lot of people that hit rock bottom, that jolts them into action. 100%. Yeah. That's, that's the thing, right? That people are just like, well, I've got nothing to lose, so I might as well. But what about the people like me who didn't hit rock bottom? I had to identify what were the things that were holding me back in the first place. So that's where you need to start. Number one, I was brought up as a traditional Greek, Greek Orthodox girl. So every step of the way, from my parents to my grandparents, they were subliminally telling me, because it was their belief system, that I would end up being a stay-at-home wife and a mother. So number one, it was the belief system that I had that contributed to me being uh, ending up there okay great now at least I've identified part of my belief system then I started to realize I was getting external validation from the pats on the back I was getting from being a great stay-at-home wife mm -hmm. so really right now I want people to almost establish what is their identity a mother a businesswoman a friend what it, what is that identity that you hold strong to and now I want you to ask yourself, does it actually fill you up? Because those two don't always align. And it didn't with me. So my identity was tied to being a great Greek wife. I was getting the validation by being a great Greek wife. So even just assessing, oh, I had to battle external validation and my own insecurities to make the change. That was a massive um, lightning strike for me and rev revelation for me. Um, and so I call those the velvet handcuffs. So it's like, you really hate what you're doing, but you get an external validation and it's the external validation that makes you proud of yourself. So now you can understand when any of us try and like even think about doing something differently, part of the insecurity comes from where, how will I feel good about myself if I fail? And so now the, the failure piece becomes such a big narrative in our minds that prevents us from starting in the first place. Oh my gosh. So what happened? What wound up happening? So what ended up happening was after eight years of being stay at home wife, supporting my husband. Um, oh, sorry, actually, I forgot one more thing just to for your listeners. If they're not sure if they're doing the thing that they love, I want them to really assess now, like so many of us use the thing. I will start when I will start. I would do. Oh, I'll do that when my kids are old. Older. I'll do that when I have more money. I'll do that when I have more time. Right. We, we use that a lot. So now I want to ask them, what is the thing that you're asking? I'll do that when. Mm -hmm. And now I want you to say, what would you change your daily activities if that when never came? 
So let's say, for instance, I want to start my business when my kids are older. Let's just put that as it. What, I mean, that's actually a bad one because it's like, what if your kids never get older? But like something like that. And then what if that never came? Would you still do what you're doing every day? And if the answer is, oh no, okay, great. Now you just establish that you're not living the life you actually want. So that is like the really big key there. So then the next part for me was eight years. I was living the life that I didn't want. Um, I was dismissing my unhappiness. That's another thing. That part of us, are so happy and excited and grateful for certain things in our lives. Like I was so grateful for having a husband that loved me. I was so grateful for having a roof over my head that anytime my mind started to um, feel bad or I was like, is this really the life you want? I went back to the gratitude thing and it can be beautiful. It can reorient instead of being the woe is me it can really give you motivation and a different perspective. But if you do that year after year, after year, after year, what ends up happening? I use the gratitude to keep me stuck. Every time I had that whisper, and I don't know if you've had this girl where that whispers in your ears, like, like do you, should you really be doing this? Do you really like this? If you live in the life you want, every time that whisper would come in, I would use gratitude to be like, well, how ungrateful are you, Lisa, to ask for more when you have a husband that loves you? How ungrateful are you, Lisa, to ask for a roof over your head, you know, when other people don't have it? Yeah. So recognizing the the language you're using the mindset and way that you're framing things and just giving yourself the absolute uh, um what's the word um acceptance or the, the the grace to say oh i can love my life over here and i can actually absolutely be profoundly unhappy over here and still ask for more like we just need to give ourselves yeah, the right so to beautiful. do that yes so I have to know what happened next. Yes, yeah. So, I, mean, know. <laughs> I mean, you you know this. You're such a good speaker that like everything you say is just like the best medicine. So it's so I'm like hanging on every word. Okay, so what happened? Thank next? you. So what ended up happening was we were living eight years where we were both dismissing our unhappiness. My husband was going out trying to make enough money. He was just on the grind. I was thinking I had to be the supportive wife. And eventually I had told myself for eight years, you know what, Lisa, just sacrifice a little. It will be for the greater good, right? How often do we do that? Where we actually are okay sacrificing for everybody else's dreams and desires, except for our own. Yes, so that was course. something. So that was what I was doing. I was sacrificing, sacrificing. And I actually didn't mind sacrificing my own dreams. The thing that I absolutely didn't allow was to ever sacrifice my relationship. And as I started to realize the profound unhappiness in my husband as an individual and as me as an individual started to affect our dynamic and our relationship, that was when I just drew the hard line. And I was like, oh, 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 this is now about to damage our relationship. We both pinky sworn on our wedding day that we would never do anything that affect that damaged our relationship. So that was where I spoke up. That was where it was like, let's stop chasing money and let's actually pivot our lives and get up every day predicated on something that we believe in and that is um, attached to a mission and my husband and his business partners at the time all came up with the idea of a protein bar so I was still the great supportive wife and so I was like oh protein bar great babe how can I support you so as they're doing this startup company they had another business that they were trying to sell because that was what they were trying to do for eight years and they hated it so as the good Greek wife, I was like, babe, how can I help you? Now, because I was the only person that was really free all the time, everything landed on me. So we're making these bars. And my husband's like, if you can just like um, measure some ingredients at home, that would be wonderful. We're going to rent this kitchen and just come with knives and rolling pins. So literally, we rented this kitchen once a week. We were cutting protein bars by hand. I can't we were even. I can't. Rolling pins. Story. <laughs> now, as the great supportive wife, I was like, cool, what do I need to do? Now, the thing to add here was when we started Quest, we had decided we were going to put our house up as collateral. So now here I am, a supportive wife with a protein bar company that's growing at 57,000%. And I'm the one they turn to when a problem arises because there's no one else to turn to because they're selling this company. So I'm like the only one that's free. And so I went from, oh, I, I know how to, put a post-it stamp on a box. I can do that. But then you grow 57,000%. So the next thing I know, I'm like using a software machine that I'm trying to figure out and I'm just not techish at all. So I'm using, trying to figure out this software and I'm literally, no joke, I need people to understand where I started from. I'm standing there with this shipping software 
I have no idea what I'm doing. When one of the partners is trying to explain it to me. I feel like I am like the opposite of techish. So I'm sitting there with my pen and paper. You think I'm joking, but he was like, all right, Lisa, so switch the computer on. I was like, wait, wait, what button do you press? He's like, this one. He's like, all right. And I was like, okay, press green button. He's like, then you go to Safari. Wait, 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 where's Safari? It's the bottom left. Okay, go to Safari bottom left. That's how bad I was. So as I'm doing this, Every time I faced an obstacle, every time I faced the things that I had no idea what I was doing, every time I faced my inadequacies, my insecurities, my incompetence, because I was, I wasn't experienced. So every time I faced it, the old Lisa, the Lisa that didn't believe in herself, the Lisa that the mindset would have actually have kept me where I was saying, you don't know how to do it, don't do it. In those moments, I was like, okay, you don't have to do it, Lisa, but if you don't do it, you lose your house. So what's more important? The ego, right, that is telling you, oh, don't face this because you don't want to fail, or your goals. It comes down to that. So when I said my goals is not to lose my house, so what's more important, feeling better about myself or not losing my house, I decided it was not losing my house. So every time I faced an obstacle, I didn't, I had the growth mindset, which allowed me, instead of saying, I can't do this, now I had to face an obstacle. And instead of saying, I can't do it, I said, I have no idea how to do it, but I better figure it out. And with that change of mindset allowed us to keep growing. I went from shipping from my living room floor one day to within two years, I had 10,000 square feet. I had 40, four zero employees underneath me working in my department alone. And we were shipping out $80 million of inventory. Now, how the hell did I do that? People think it's confidence. Girl, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I had radical confidence, which means I believe in myself to get back up when I fall. That's it. I believe that I can get back up and I can believe in myself that if with enough time, effort and commitment, I will be able to figure it out. And so given in a small little example that people was like, well, did you really do that? Let me just tell you a story where one day we just happened to have enough boxes early days and UPS comes along and UPS is like, you know what? I can actually pick up a lot more boxes if you put them on the pallet next time. And I was like, all right, thanks, mate. Appreciate it. I got it. I had no idea what a bloody pallet was. So I run back to Google and I'm like typing in, what is a pallet? And I see an image. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen those. I guess that's what it's called. Where do I get one from? You can get one delivered. Okay, how do I get one today? And I'm literally just asking Google. So the next thing I know, a pallet shows up. I put all the boxes in the pallet and I'm like, oh, this is easier. The next day, UPS guy comes and he's like, oh, well done. I'm like, oh, thanks, mate. And I move on. And so when you have that mindset from something as small as that, and you take it all the way up to, I don't know how to build a business. I don't know how to get on stage. I don't know how to create my own show. I don't know how to start a YouTube channel. I don't know how to be in front of the camera. You better believe that I have changed my identity. My identity no longer is the stay-at-home wife that looks for external validation. My identity now is of the learner. Now, the learner means that you can come at me with anything. I can fail. I can have negative voice in my head. I can have people telling me, which we actually did, have people tell us the world needs another protein bar like it needs another hole in the head. Now, we still became second fastest growing company in North America and became a billion dollar company with from one from zero to five years. How did we do that? Because we believed it was possible because we didn't leave learn. uh, Sorry, we didn't let other people's opinions affect how we show up. When we had an obstacle, we figured it out. When I personally didn't believe in myself and I personally had that voice in my head telling me I, I was no good. I just reminded myself it was a choice to either say I can't or I can figure it out. And that is what radical confidence is. Oh my God, you made me cry. I mean, when you said radical confidence was just being able to get back up again, it it just made me cry on impact, on hearing those words. Because when you look at the cover of your book and you see your, your vibration, I mean, it is so just obvious how much life force and magnetism you exude. And then you spend a second with you or you watch any of your content and you feel like smacked in the face with this, mm-hmm. the, the, the confidence, the vibration, the enthusiasm, the love, the high, you know, the high frequency. And so 
I'm thinking about all of that and how that is where you're at and that's what you're attuning to and that's what you're teaching and to hear you then say, right. So as I'm like growing through this, it really was radical to just be at a place to say, I'm going to figure this next little step out and get back up. And everyone who's listening can do that. And it is radical because it's so much of a revolution to think of it that way. So that is just so epic. And it's like everything out of your mouth is like 10 mic drops. Like that's that in of itself (laughs) is like literally a farm. You're a pharmacist. Like you just handed people the best medicine. But then also when you said a zero to a billion dollars, because we believed in it and you're right, anyone who's ever done anything, whether they're starting their own talk show, oh, nobody's buying those, they've been done. Oh, we're gonna do another yoga studio down the block. Oh, there's a million already. Of course, right? People would say to you, well, there's already how many protein bars? And you said, yeah, but we just believed what we believed. We didn't allow them. Now, what did you learn along the way? Because zero to a billion in five years, I mean, Howard Schultz has been here He didn't do that in five years. I don't think Starbucks did that in five years. What do you think was different beyond just these gorgeous, stunning, striking beliefs that no doubt probably made up for 99% of why? What's the other 1%? What else do you think was part of the secret sauce? Yeah. And so I actually thank you for this question. It's so beautiful because I actually want to caveat everything and saying, I started like five different businesses before Quest with my husband. So like, it is so imperative that people know that that the success isn't guaranteed. So even with a company that's billion dollars, even with our company now at Impact Theory, I, as I wrote the book, I just remind myself, Lisa, success isn't guaranteed. So number one, you better freaking love the journey. That's it. You better love the journey because let's even just talk about my book for a second. I didn't go in there with blind belief. I went in there with radical confidence to write the book. I've never written a book before. So why on earth would I think that I I know everything about writing a book? So anything anyone is doing, go in there with the most humble um, mindset you possibly can be, be the learner and soak in as many lessons as you possibly can. So that was number one is that you need to just, when you're starting anything, it's like, give yourself the grace to not think that you're the shit. Can I swear on this podcast? That's fine. Okay. They don't believe that you're, you know, the great stuff. And it's just like, be humble and learn. Then the next part for me, at least, especially with this book is that success isn't guaranteed. So how do I make sure, because I know it's inevitable with me as a person, that when something does well, I feel great. And when something fails, I feel badly about myself. So before I even release the book, how do I create internal validation so that the results Mm -hmm. don't have an impact on how I feel about myself and my self-worth? Because that's the key, right? I can give you all the gems about quest nutrition i can tell you it was started in 2010 that was when social media was coming out no one was using facebook as a marketing tool like i can tell you the things about very specifically quest a lot of it was timing a lot of it with decision making a lot of it was we believed in the product we needed it in our lives but all of that actually becomes incidental because i don't want to ignore the fact that we did have five other companies that failed and i don't want to ignore the fact that anything i try new i don't think i have the freaking midas touch i don't believe in the freaking midas touch yeah. i believe in the person as an individual so for me i believe in myself that i may not know anything today But you better believe that if I choose to, I will freaking learn. I'll put in the time, I'll put in the energy, and I'll put in the consistency. And over time, I will see, is this aligned with a life I actually want? Because again, success isn't guaranteed. So with everything that I'm saying is like, even with my book, I did the validation point. So I said, okay, Lisa, you don't know anything now. What is going to be an internal success for you? Because that's really the point is how do you, like almost face failure after failure after failure without the um, effect of your enthusiasm. That's the freaking key. Like you take someone like Edison and Edison, it took him, someone asked him or something like, how did you keep momentum after 10,000 failures before when you finally um, discovered the light bulb? And his response was, it wasn't 10,000 failures, it was 10,000 lessons. Now, if you think of them as failures, 
eventually your ego is going to get dented so much. The voice in your head is going to tell you you're no good, so you're never going to keep going. So imagine Edison had that mentality. He may have stopped at 9,562. But because he saw them as lessons every, and he loved the process, every time he failed, he took a lesson from it and improved it. And that's how you end up getting to the goal. So for me, it was, am I willing to go in there as the student and the learner? Because now I can be proud, even if the book fails, I can be proud that I went in there as a learner. Okay, yes. Lisa, if can you give it your all? Because you know, right? Like deep down, you can convince everyone one else oh my god I worked my ass off and I did everything I humanly possibly could but you know you know so all I said to myself is are you going to commit to give it your all because I if I do and I go in there as the learner with a humble mindset that I'm going to learn myself and I give it every ounce of my being there's nowhere else to go I can just say you know what Lisa I'm proud that you showed up because you know what no one else you can't blame anyone else on whether you showed up or not I mean, you can try, but that just becomes an excuse. I could blame my company. I could blame my husband. I can blame my employees on whether I showed up or not. But that's down to me. So I just decided before I even wrote one word on the paper of my book was I'm going to be the learner. I'm going to build my my validation within myself, my self-worth within myself, so that before you even release the book, Lisa, you feel validated and it doesn't matter how the book does now i'm not gonna lie of course it's gonna stink like i am not an i don't bs people it's like failure still failure so now that's actually why i wrote the chapter in my book called when the beep hits the fan wear goggles because the point of that chapter is (laughs) guys we've got to stop freaking worrying about whether we fail and the beep hits the fan or not you've got to just stop worrying about it because if you try anything new anything new you will fail at some point so why on earth are we wasting energy there so if it's a business that someone's trying right now like go in knowing that failure is a very possible big possibility and instead of worrying about it now wear goggles figure out what you're gonna do when it hits the fan when you fail what are you going to do and now you're actually putting time and energy into something that actually serves you Yeah. So good. I mean, it's so good. I often say, and I'm sure you, you feel the same way, you know, talking to hundreds of thousands of women, it's not a business problem. It's a courage problem. And Mm -hmm. my my friend and mentor, Seth Godin wrote this, wrote a bunch of books, but one of his books, you might know what it's like, it's, it's like 70 pages, but it's an amazing book. It's called the dip. And he's like, I want you to anticipate that Mm -hmm. he's going to hit the fan. And I want you to anticipate what you're going to do because it's on the other side of the dip that fewer people are there, right? Because they all hit the dip and they don't expect it. And now they're destroyed by it, right? And so I love what you're saying. And you're so right when you say, yes, we were at the right place and we understood Facebook and social media, but it really is incidental because this world is more like a radio than it is building blocks. Hmm. And it's a tuning fork. And what you send out comes back. So if you are coming from this place of wholeness, you're just going to be a match for wholeness. And what you said about preemptively deciding what's going to be your internal validation. I studied for a couple of years. I know you've been in LA. There's that UCLA mindfulness center. Mm. Right? So I took, I took a couple of years of, of classes there. And there was a study they did on people. Of course, that's your munch. You guys, she's holding up a Wonder Woman mug. Um, <laughs> she is Wonder Woman. So there, there was a study that they did where people set themselves up that they would be happy when they got this Academy Award. They got this Oscar. They mm. would be happy when they won this Olympic race. They would be happy. And here's the kicker. The people who got it, who got the win, who hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list, who got the best actor, best actress, all the stuff. They all said the day after they've never felt more down. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they decided that when I hit this goalpost, I'm going to feel so good about myself in a way that will be worth everything rather than deciding that our internal sense of self won't be 
because, oh man, right? Get ready. You know, I remember I, I used to be a songwriter and I was in this billboard magazine. I have, I actually have it. It doesn't matter. And I remember the day it came out and there was this full page story. Oh, I want to see it. If you got a handy. This yeah, let's show it, girl. This is from, like, I was just showing this up. This is from 2000. And it's so cute. I was just showing it to somebody earlier today. Um, That's a pick. Anyways, the thing is, I remember when it came out and I went to the newsstand, you know? Yeah. And I was like, this is my moment. This is going to change everything. Mm -hmm. And the, de the day after, I was like in sweats and I was like crying. Mm -hmm. and nothing changed, right? Yeah. Nothing changed. So it's so it's crucial. And I want to ask you something. I mean, I, I, I feel like I really could sit next to a fire and be at a camp out and talk to you for 97 hours straight. Um, <laughs> Sounds like fun. <laughs> you did something else that I think is a Herculean amount of strength. Hmm. We live in a time and place where marriage is disposable. Mm -hmm. And you described this period in your life. And I was ready for you to say that you guys broke up. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was confused is because I, I know how close you are with your husband and how you do everything together. So I'm thinking, okay, so she was married to someone first. <laughs> I love this. And then I'm thinking, but wait, maybe there's another dimension to her and to the story. And then you get to the point where you said, wait a second, hang on. We pinky promised yeah. that we would not allow anything to come in between us. And Lisa, you and I both know. And by the way, there are people who needed to get a divorce because mm -hmm. it was so toxic and God bless, because everyone is the only one who knows what's going on behind closed doors. So let's really honor that. And we also know that there is a world, a culture in which people would not necessarily have stopped and say, hang on, maybe this isn't about you and me. But because the, the, the first thing, right? Sometimes people pull a geographic, oh, I'll just move. Or something mm -hmm. like, oh, if I just get rid of you, yeah, right? you didn't do that. And I, I'm amazed by that. How on earth did you not do that? And then how have you continued to work so closely with this person and keep a marriage that feels life-giving? Thank you, girl. And what's interesting is we actually did go to pull a location. What did you just call it? Like a location change or something like that. Pull a geographic. Pull a geographic. I love that. Um, we did. So it was originally, I was like, babe, we have to change something. This isn't, you know, we're both miserable. And our idea was, oh, let's move to Greece. And so as we're like, cool, let's move to Greece. I'm like, all right, babe, so you're going to go in and quit and we're going to find an apartment. We're going to move to Greece. So he goes in to quit to his business partners because he hated the job that they were doing together. And as he went in and quit, they admitted they were miserable too. And that was the catalyst to, okay, let's sell this company. And now what would we do predicated on passion? And that was Quest. So that was, we ended up not moving, but um, it's so true. People think that changing your environment is going to change who you are the truth is it doesn't it just it's like shadows they still follow you everywhere you know so I'm about to celebrate my 20 year wedding anniversary we've been together for 22 years I was 21 when I met him so this has been something that is the biggest pride of my life way more than the businesses I've ever built and the reason being is multiple things but first of all you need to decide on what type of tennis game you're playing now what do I mean by that when you, you look all confused, which I love. All no, right. I'm touched. I'm so touched by you. It's amazing. Thank you, girl. So with tennis, it's kind of like, you know, have you ever seen couples where it's, it, they feel like they're just ping-ponging. It's like, yeah, but you did this. And then they put the hit ball right. Yeah, but you did this. But you're whatever. Now that's a game of singles. I choose to play a game of doubles, which means that me and my husband are on the same side of the net. We've agreed that we want to win the cup together. In singles, only one person can win. But now when you're doubles, you're on the same net. And now think about when I'm weak. Think about when, if I've got a bad backhand, 
My husband has my back. He's got the ball if I miss it and vice versa. That means that we're not trying to compete against each other. It means that we support each other. I don't know if you want me to keep going or if you want to express it's your so emotions. Beautiful. I know it's so beautiful. I love that analogy. And like that, that became the starting point because now whenever you have a debate, a disagreement, if you just have that analogy in your head, it's like, oh, we're trying to win this together. What is he saying? We're trying to win this together. What is he weak at? Actually, I'm weak right, right now. And instead of him trying to use it against me, he's actually got my back and he's recognizing I'm weak right now. Oh my gosh. This is you why just... you're so successful. Because the amount of strength that takes, there's so many people, not a ton, but there's a, there is a lot of people who figured out business and you can, and I, we've interviewed 650 people on the show, millionaires, billionaires, everybody's been here. You've probably interviewed most of the exact same people and probably even more. But the most challenging obstacle race is intimacy. And in my notes, Emma, who's been with me since episode one she's been with me the whole time she gives me background on people right so I knew who you were through friends I also knew your book they sent it to me blah 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 but she wrote up some notes and told me you grew up in London and your parents had gotten divorced it was mm -hmm. like part of it and I'm sitting here looking at you thinking you were a four-year-old one time a five-year-old <laughs> a nine-year-old a 12-year-old and that girl who lived through that is saying this to me mm. And I'm just like, I just like Thank you, bow to that strength. And I don't even get it because having lived through that, the studies, the data is so mm. clear. It's so concrete. My parents are divorced. My dad's been married three times. My mom's never let anyone in. <laughs> she never really mm. left the house or had anyone come in since then. And I know it affects me on a daily basis and I can crush it at work. And all of my stuff comes up at home mm. and I'm looking at you and I'm like, all right, this girl, definitely. I can't wait for this podcast. She's got a lot to teach me. Look what she's done. Look how gorgeous she is. Look at her vibe. Mm. But there's this whole other piece. It's giant. How do you explain to yourself even how you weathered that as a child, right? That is a version of trauma. And yet you say and live the way you live now. Thank you for that, girl. It's multiple things. One, it was assessing what kind of, like before I even met my husband, I just saw my parents get divorced. I saw other parents that got divorced. I heard women, you know, like when you're younger, you kind of hear the adult women talking and you're like listening in. It's like, I would hear women say, you know, like complain about the guys not and, um, not buying them flowers, not being romantic. And yeah. then, you know, as I would get older, I hear other women be like, oh, I've got to give it up today because it's his birthday. And I'm oh! like, I would just like, <laughs> and so like, I, I would just process things and be like, hang on a minute. You're complaining that he doesn't do this for you. And yet now you're complaining that you have to do this for him. And so things just like, I just trusted my instincts in the sense of like, that didn't feel right. Um, and then obviously seeing my parents break up, I was always, if I want to have a long-term relationship, I need to set the person up for success. Like set your, you want your partner to freaking win. Just want them to win. And what does that mean? Is that they're not a freaking mind reader. So if there's a problem, if you, if you want them to do something, don't test them, just be honest. And so with that honesty, with me and my husband, when I first met him, almost from day one, I wanted to set him up for success when I realized we were getting serious. So what does that mean? I set my boundaries and I said, babe, because I love you so much and I want our relationship to last forever. These are the two things that are non-negotiable in my life. You don't ever get to lay a hand on me physically and you don't get to cheat on me. And I just want to set you up for success, babe, because I know a lot of people say that. But, <laughs> but say but, that these two things. Yeah, no, but, no. but let me be very clear. It doesn't mean like I know people are like, well, of course, Lisa, that's in, that should be like, why would you have to say that? 
Well, I wanted to be clear with him that there would be no discussion. If I, literally, I found out you cheat on me, 30 seconds later, I'm out the door. And so let me just set you up for success. There's no convincing me. There's no talking. There's literally no talking. I find this out, I'm out. So now I've just set the boundaries for both of us, right? It's about the beauty. And it's not like, hey, don't cross my boundary. No. It, it's like, let's sit down and actually talk about what our non-negotiables right. are. Right. Next thing is that the, one of the most heartbreaking phrases I hear, and guys say this to me, guys say this to me, a happy wife is a happy life. Yeah, I've heard it. That breaks my heart. Are you saying that you don't care about your own happiness? And like, I'm just, why on earth should my husband care more about my happiness? And I should care about my happiness more than him. Right, not sustainable. Yeah. Not sustainable. So how do you overcome that? Me and my husband have a little game that we play every single week. Every single week. The game is called, what is your selfish desire? Now, what that means is, you don't think about anyone else. You don't, if you've got kids, you don't think about your kids. You don't think about your parents. You don't think about your spouse. You don't think about having to feed your fish. You literally don't think about anything except what is that selfish thing you want to do? And we play this every single weekend. And now the whole point is, is to go, this is what you selfishly want. This is what I selfishly want. Now, A, is there a compromise? Or maybe this week you get what you want and I don't. And next week I get what I want and you don't. But the whole point is to make sure that you both get heard, you both feel seen and you both show up for each other. Mm, so there's like a million different things that we do within our relationship, but those are like the little things that to me are so important um, in order to build your relationship. And then communication and trust and obviously the kind of the big key items, which I can go deep it's down so, into. It's so extraordinary. It's so extra, extraordinary. And I love that you guys have been for, for a while, like you've pivoted into this world of content because truly I say this from my heart, I am so moved by this conversation. Mm -hmm. And as many protein bars as you sold and literally gave nutrition, your words are the greatest nutrition that we could ever have. And the two of you are, who, who better to learn from than two people who like it all checks out. Like this person takes the same principles and applies it to both sides of their life, the inner and the outer. And it's so gorgeous. Um, we okay, can I just add, can I add one yeah. more thing? And in saying all that, I think the one of the reasons why me and my husband also wanted to do some content even together was like, we don't have a perfect marriage. There is no freaking such thing. There's no such thing as a perfect marriage. And so what I'm the most proud of is that there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. And yet me and my husband still have our downfalls. We still have our roller coasters where we have bad phases of our marriage. And yet we still keep showing up and putting our relationship as the most important thing. And so that's the thing that we're always evolving. Like we're always coming up with techniques and strategies. I was gonna see if I had one really close to me now. Oh, can I just show you something? Like this was the thing that, so in moments where me and my husband, we were so stressed, neither of us were able to communicate. And so we noticed that we were like butting heads and we'd been, married for years and years and we realized oh this is becoming a problem in our marriage we're unable to and what ends up happening is when you're really stressed I don't know if you find this but when you're really stressed like your, your moods last longer so what would end up happening is <laughs> right like you end up you know we would go on date night because we were so busy so um and so we'd do a date night and then now we're both exhausted. So when we end up bickering and before you know it, the one date night you freaking have in a month, you end up arguing for the whole time. Sure. So instead of judging myself and instead of judging my husband over that, I go, cool, this doesn't serve us. This isn't great for our relationship. How do I overcome that? What strategy and tool? So I found these little coins. It says love. And what I did is I took this coin I said, all right, babe, let's agree on what this coin means. This means we're both being ridiculous and we're both emotional. And the, the core of our relationship really is that we love each other. Do we agree on the meaning of the chip? And he said, yes. I was like, great, you get one and I get one. Aww. We're, we're going to carry it with us when we go out. And so what we did is we carried it with us. The moment we started to bicker and one of us realized, oh, this is one of those moments. I got out this, this little coin and I slid it across the table at a restaurant 
And he picked it up and he's like, I love you too, baby. And then we just continued our wonderful date night. Amazing. So the, that's, that's amazing. the point that, thank you for giving me the space to say that because the reason why I wanted to bring it up is these are the things that I do on a daily basis, not on a daily, but I find a problem. Oh, I don't judge us. I don't go, oh, we've been married for 20 years. I can't believe we have this problem. I don't ever say that. I just say, oh, here's a problem. It needs a solution because I plan to be married for the rest of my life. Yeah. So what is the solution here? And it's so stunning because what good is making a billion dollars if you go home and there's a feeling of loneliness or there's just like this pit of despair and you have a bad marriage and a marriage that you're not attending. I mean, it's thank God, right. That you guys actually then have things that you can celebrate them. That's the best part. So speaking of all of that, and this book, you guys have to get it. This should be required reading for everyone who listens to my <laughs> podcast and your podcast, Women of Impact, which everybody should subscribe to. We'll put the links to everything in the show notes and I'll do swipe ups to it. You talk about becoming the hero of your own life. Yeah. It's part of the title, 10 No BS Lessons on Becoming the Hero of Your Own Life. And obviously so much of what you've already said is so heroic. What do you think about the limits that people literally, that to them is reality, right? Mm -hmm. Like I say now, we're, we're, we're walking around in a virtual reality headset. And I think I got that from Joe Dispenza, right? And then the idea being that like, no, no, no. Reality, Deepak Chopra was here a month ago or something. And he's like, no, no, reality is abundant. Like every acorn is the promise of a thousand, <laughs> right? What are you, what, it, what, where do you come up with? No, this is impossible. No, this is a problem. No, that's not possible. And here you are, this firecracker, fireworks, like you're everything in this tiny little package, right? And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. We believed it was possible, right? Yeah. How do you help people see actual reality when they've decided what reality is and they're living inside of this like made up fishbowl all the time? How do you help them get over those? Oh, God, that's such a great question. I mean, the first thing that came to mind is, does that mindset serve you and your goals and the life you want? Like, it's that simple. Like, if I think to myself, oh, I can't do that. But I, let's say I say, oh, I can't, um, I can't build a company. And so I'm just not going to get, like, I, I can't build a company, but yet I want to build a studio. All right, well, does that mindset actually serve what I'm trying to do and my goals? Yes or no? And so if it's no, it's like, oh, well, how do I serve my goals? And it, I don't know, like that almost seems so simple, but to me, I think I personally need something simple like that. I can't have something complex. I just need a simple question because honestly, that's sometimes how I think. Like I just, I actually start to just peel things apart and be like, oh, it's, it's that simple. Like, does this serve me? Yes or no. And there was one time actually where I was watching The Notebook and there's a scene where someone, uh, one of them is playing the piano. And I was like, oh, I really wish I could play the piano. And my husband turns around to me and he's like, babe, isn't it amazing to think that you could be the best pianist if you really wanted to be? And I turned to him and I was like, yes, yes, it is. Now, here's the idea behind that notion. Let's say I really, so I'm in my 40s. I could say, no, I can't be the best pianist. Okay, then what does that mean? I'm never even going to get started. But let's say I really want to. What I do is I play no bullshit. What would it take? So this is another game. <laughs> and so you play no bullshit. What would it take to actually become the best pianist in the world? Now I'm talking from someone that cannot even read music. So let me just start state right now. If in real time, you said to me, you can't play the piano. I would actually beg to differ. I would say, well, hang on a minute. If I played 17 hours a day, I never went on a date night. This is a no bullshit. What would it actually take to be the, the best pianist? All right. So let me see. I would take the best pianist and I would see how many hours they practiced in their lifetime. I would then look at my life and go, okay, if I got that amount of hours in my day, how old would I be to be the best pianist? And how many hours would I need to do on a daily basis? So now my plan goes, all right, I have to play 18 hours a day. I know uh, I can't go on vacation. I have to ditch date night. You have to do that for 20 years, Lisa. Oh, and by the way, you actually have to sell your house because currently you've just got a, a crappy kid's toy keyboard. And in order to become the best pianist, you need to buy a piano. I could easily say I can't buy a piano or I could say, okay, I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to live in a studio apartment and I'm going to fit the piano in my house. 
in my apartment. So now I go, okay, that's the no BS, how I become the best pianist in the world. And now the beautiful thing is I can say whether I choose to or not. And now if you were to ask me, Lisa, can you play the piano? My response isn't going to be, I can't. My response is going to be, you know what? I've chosen not to. So when you talk about mindset, when you talk about the words you use, thinking in a different way in both senses. So taking something that you've dismissed already, play the game. And then it says, do you actually want to do it? Because now your response to other people will make you feel good about yourself because it's no longer you're incapable. It's no longer it's impossible. It is I have chosen not to. You want to talk about taking your power back and really like leaning into who you are and taking full ownership and be the hero of your own life. It all comes back to language, how you approach things. And if you believe something is possible or not. Oh, it's so good. So let me ask you this follow-up question as we're wrapping up. So, and again, I really do want to honor because I'm not just saying this. There are people listening and there are people in the world who do not desire to build an empire, Mm -hmm. who do not want to make the absolute maximum amount of impact in the world because that's not their assignment, right? Maybe God has a totally different assignment for them and thank thank God, all right? So I just want to say that. But let's say somebody's listening and she's been clear She knows that she wants to make a billion dollars, but there's been a thought, there's no way I could do that. And then she listens to this episode and she's heard Jamie's episode, right? Jamie Kern Lima's episode. And she's like, wait a minute, people are doing that. What do you say, piggybacking on what you just said? I I think I know what your answer is going to be, right? Is it possible? And with that, right, all this stuff about money and the beliefs about scarcity come up and So what do you say to her? Is that something that she could say, like the piano, I can choose to do so, and I can? Yes, I well, I think, I don't necessarily believe in blind confidence. So I actually think you need to play the game. No BS, what would it actually take for you to build a company that's worth a billion dollars? Like, you have to play that scenario out before you blindly commit, because I don't blindly go, oh, I'm going to, this is going to be amazing. I mean, I like to think it's going to be amazing, right? right? But it's like, there's no freaking guarantee. So I need a path. I need a strategy. I need a way to approach it. I need an understanding of what it's actually going to take to do it. Because when people look at my relationship with Tom, for instance, the amount of people that are just like, oh my God, you guys are so lucky. It's like, it's going to to do with like you know how many t- how many hours 100%. I put into my relationship I put 100%. my pro- my relationship above my my business for sure so when people say oh my god you're so lucky it's like actually play the no bullshit game what would it take to have a relationship like me and my husband's and then just decide if that's the relationship you want it yeah. means you never say sorry if you're not sorry like that literally me and my husband would li- keep talking where it's easier to say, you know what? I just wish I can say sorry for hurting your feelings so that I can just freaking brush this under the rug and move on. But we know that that doesn't serve it. So we will be uncomfortable and have the uncomfortable discussions for four hours, five hours, six hours. So God anyway, the key being ask the question, no BS, what would it take? And then assume you're going to fail. Now, why are you going to assume? Because I want you to enjoy the path. I want you to enjoy the journey because ultimately there is no guarantee. Do you, can you believe in yourself? A hundred percent. Can you show up every freaking day fighting for it? A hundred percent, but there's still no guarantee. So do you love the life? And then also I'm just going to be the one that's saying having a number to hear will have, I worry will have empty um, results to your point of exactly what you said, right? It's like, you get the accolades, you get the award. And the thing that you think you're going to feel, I don't know anyone who has actually felt the thing they think they're going to feel. Now, why? I think because when you're, if you're looking up, like I've, that was my dream to win an Academy Award. So I'm obsessed wow. with, female, with female movie directors, obsessed. That was my goal. I wanted to be the first female to win an Academy Award in directing so like patty jenkins i'm in love with right like um there's so many female directors yeah. that i'm like they are the like they win an academy award and i'm like oh my god that looks so like yeah, i get amazing. it now you have the feeling of how you see them so you think you're gonna have that feeling about yourself when you get there but the truth is you don't 
So now it has to be more than just a number, more than just an award. So we actually sold Quest in two portions. And the first portion that we sold Quest in was a small amount, but that was really the pivot that changed our lives. So literally, I mean, one day you go from, you've got a Ford Focus with a hole in the exhaust and the <laughs> steering wheel is shaking when you go over 60 miles an hour to all of a sudden now you can go buy a freaking Ferrari, right? Like that's actually like, like that. Crazy. So it's crazy. Now, let me tell you, me and my husband, over time, as we built Quest, for me and him, it was about the mission. So we really, like, it was originally like, how do I save my house? And then it became, oh my God, I can't believe it. What am I made of? This is so exciting. I can prove to myself every day that I can improve myself. So that became my North Star. And then over time, as I faced more obstacles, it was the mission. So I had women that were riding in that basically this one woman said she was 40 pounds anorexic and in on her deathbed in hospital. So, 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 so sad. Oh my gosh. gosh. And she wrote in saying, that she thanked us for Quest Bars because we finally made her okay with calories again. There was another woman that wrote in saying she had a type one diabetic son. And for years, she had to snatch and take cupcakes and things out of his hands whenever he was at parties. And she said that he can actually eat Quest Bars now and his insulin level doesn't spike. And so she said, thank you for making me feel like a better mother. So now my, you can, right? Like how emotional can you get bit. over that? Yeah. Yes. There's so no, now there's no amount. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that was the thing. So we went from, I was driven by the fear of losing my house, but that's a fear-based motivation that isn't sustainable. And my motivation and my mission turned into a mission-based, which was I get to help anorexic women. I grew up with my mom borderline anorexic and then catapulted the opposite direction into severe obesity. And so when it comes to health, nutrition, and weight, you better believe I will show up every day for that. So literally you think I'm joking. There was one day where we were selling a small portion of the company and you hear rumors but until the actual money hits your account anything can happen so we're sitting there for months and then we hear rumors that one day all of a sudden today's the day so we're working out in the garage in our little cheapskate little garage the workout system that we had and my husband in between reps is refreshing his phone right and so we're sitting there refresh refresh did we get it no refresh refresh did we get it no refresh oh my god it's hit our account life changing right We took a couple of photos. We took a couple of selfies. And what did we do? We got changed and went to work. We didn't tell a soul. I told my mom and dad, but we didn't tell anyone in the company. Why? Because we showed up every day for the mission and not for the money. And so now you can understand why I think wealth creation is beautiful. I think women being wealth creators as like as humans is incredible. And I want to encourage that because I think just like a superpower, you can use money for good or you can use it for evil. But how do you make sure it doesn't dictate how you show up every day? And that is how, so even to your question about this, you know, if there's someone at home listening, wanting to make a billion dollars, I like, and this is my own experience. I would say that is the wrong goal because you'll never get satisfied. No, no. Oh my gosh. This is the second time I'm crying in this conversation. It's so, it's just, um, it's such an honor to sit with you. Thank you, girl. I can't believe how on top of everything you have been a part of, that you have this much generosity in an interview because Mm. you've done so many of these and the amount of full heart, enthusiastic, talking to me like I am the first person you've ever told this to is it's so inspiring can I tell you a phrase that I use a lot treat each day like it's your day one and I've got a shirt that we made it in Pathy. We didn't sell very well, so we don't sell them anymore. But I have a shirt that <laughs> is- Total failure, by I the know. way. Yeah, there you go. Total failure. I don't mind freaking owning up to that. But I freaking love it. So I still okay. wear my shirt. It's D-O, day one. Put it together. What does it spell? Do. Mm. So it's every single morning. Like, and this is how, like, I don't, I don't get steered by money. I get steered by impact. Why? Because I've dedicated- 
dedicated my life to my mission. And so sitting with you, I've never officially met you before. So it's like, I feel very intimately close to you having these discussions. And because my North Star is impact and I treat every day like it's my day one. And so that means that every day I look inside myself and and I say to myself, did I grow today? Did I do better today? Did I show up today? It's all internal. It has to be for me to keep going. Like the second you wait for external validation, I mean, I'm just going to circle again to external validation. So I mean, it's incredible. And can I also just say about your external that every drop of your style from your hair to your clothes, to the way you style your office, I'm just so here for it. I'm like, <laughs> who is this soul? such a force and what's so awesome literally awesome is that you are so young and you have let's say at least 80 60 80 100 years who knows you're you're so you're such a buddy but you can definitely live into like 130 who knows like you literally scratch the surface like your life force it it's a magnet it like literally it's 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 moving other things into life because it's so powerful so I'm like oh my god like what on earth is coming next I'm so excited that we got to meet and this was the best tell so where can everybody follow along and find you and love you and buy the book oh my god thank you my homie so people can go to radicalconfidence.com um and if they buy the book from there and enter their order number, I actually have a nine part coaching class that I give away for free. <laughs> um, again, I, I, again, my North Star's impact. So I definitely want to make sure I think video content is just a different way of consuming things than, you know, a book. So I wanted to make sure that I covered both angles. So you can go over to radicalconfidence.com. You can follow me at, at Lisa Billu or my interviews on YouTube, uh, women, in, women of impact. Gorgeous. That's it. That's how you do it.